Today we're going to talk about a system that is crucial when it comes to pH balance and fluid balance. Today we're going to talk about the ATIT's version 7 portion of the exam, more specifically human anatomy and physiology, and we're going to be discussing the urinary system. Let's get started. Let's begin by tackling two crucial survival challenges. First, we need to maintain osmotic pressure. This is essential because it involves the regulation of water and solute levels found throughout our body. Secondly, the body must eliminate metabolic waste. Metabolic waste can include things like carbon dioxide and nitrogenous waste, which are byproducts of protein breakdown, a frequent occurrence in metabolic processes. The urinary system is designed to address these two critical issues, with various organs and structures contributing to its function. The skin, for instance, plays a role in excreting water and other substances. The liver is heavily involved in detoxification and produces urea, and the lungs are responsible for expelling carbon dioxide gas. It's important to remember that these organs also participate in other body systems. The skin is part of the integumentary system, the liver assists with digestion, and the lungs are crucial when it comes to the respiratory system. Our primary focus today is going to be on the kidneys, which are a key player when it comes to the urinary system, but just know that all of these systems work concurrently in order to help obtain these survival balances. The urinary system is made up of a couple different kinds of organs. We start off with the kidneys up here at the top, which are just like kidney shaped beans that hold all of our urine and helps process all of those metabolic wastes. They go down to the ureters that ultimately lead down to our bladder where the urine is stored and then ultimately to the urethra where the urine is going to be expelled. So when we talk about urine production, this is primarily occurring in the kidneys. Each kidney contains approximately 1 million nephrons, which are the fundamental working units of the kidney. The primary function of our nephron is to filter waste products from the blood and convert it into urine. We're going to start our exploration of the nephron when it comes to the glomerulus, which is a specialized cluster of capillaries. This cluster is going to be encased in our Bowman's capsule. Here, blood pressure is going to push that fluid from the blood into the glomerulus, into the Bowman's capsule, initiating what we call the filtration process. Once the fluid enters the Bowman's capsule, it is referred to as filtrate. But what exactly does filtrate mean? Filtrate is a fluid that's going to contain several key components. You're going to see things like water, glucose, amino acids, and various different kinds of salts. Additionally, you're going to see things like hydrogen ions, bicarbonate ions, and other miscellaneous ions. If present, medications as well as some vitamins may also be found in our filtrate. And it's also going to contain things like urea, which is a nitrogenous waste product generated by our liver that the body needs to eliminate. The nephron subjects that filtrate to an intensive processing journey. As the filtrate moves through that nephron, some of that is going to be reabsorbed, which means that specific filtrate components are going to cross back from the nephron into the surrounding interstitial fluid, and then are going to be recirculated throughout the body. However, specific components are going to be retained in the nephron's tubules to be eliminated as waste materials, and eventually they're going to be excreted as urine. Renal secretion refers to the process of either passive or active transport of substances from the blood into the renal tubule, where they will eventually be excreted as urine. This is basically the opposite of reabsorption. Substances might move in and out of the nephron passively, or they may undergo facilitated diffusion, processes that do not require ATP, also known as passive transport. These types of transports operate along a concentration gradient, where solutes or fluids are going to move from higher concentrations to lower concentrations. Occasionally, some substances will need to go through the process of active transport, where they are going to require ATP. Typically, you're going to see substances moving from a lower concentration to a higher concentration. While we aren't delving deeply into the specific types of transports when it comes to this video, you can rewatch them through the chemistry portion of our ATIT's videos. Now that we understand these concepts, let's dive deeper into our nephron. From our Bowman's capsule, we're going to move into our proximal convoluted tubule. Proximal means near, indicating that this tubule is closest to our glomerulus, which is significant because there's another tubule further along. In the proximal tubule, salt is going to be transported into our interstitial fluid. 
As you may know, water follows salt by osmosis, which is to be expected since that interstitial fluid becomes hypertonic due to that salt moving out into our interstitial fluid. Thus, we typically say that salt and water are going to be reabsorbed because they're leaving the nephron and moving into that fluid. Other substances like glucose, amino acids, potassium, as well as bicarb are also going to be reabsorbed here, meaning that they are going to leave that proximal convoluted tubule and be transported into that interstitial fluid, either through active or passive transport. When we discuss reabsorption, it's really important to note that not all substances are gonna be fully reabsorbed. Some of these substances, even though they're being reabsorbed in this particular area, are still going to remain in that filtrate inside that proximal convoluted tubule. Secretion refers to substances moving from the fluid outside of the tubule to inside our proximal convoluted tubule. So in this case, you're going to see certain things being secreted like hydrogen ions and ammonium. With certain substances being reabsorbed and others being secreted, such as like we see with our bicarbonate and our hydrogen, it's clear that the proximal convoluted tubule plays a crucial role when it comes to regulating our body's pH. Next up, let's explore our loop of Henle, which consists of a descending limb that moves downward and an ascending limb, which moves upward. We're gonna begin by discussing our descending limb. And this contains numerous aquaporins that are gonna be found here. These are special channels that facilitate the easy passage of water. Here, water is going to be reabsorbed into our interstitial fluid, which at this point we know is hypertonic because we have a higher concentration of solutes found inside of this area versus what's found in the filtrate inside of the loop of Henle. As we discussed, water is going to move osmotically towards that hypertonic area following that gradient solute concentration. What's also interesting is that the descending loop of Henle does not have channels for most solutes, such as salt like we talked about before. So all of that salt that's still remaining within our loop is going to remain here inside this portion of the nephron. As the water is continuously exiting outside the descending loop of Henle, and as we continue to move further down this loop, you're going to find that the concentration of solutes found within our filtrate is going to increase. So what exactly does that mean? That means that we're going to see a lot more salts in this area without a whole lot of water. So as we transition to that ascending loop of Henle, you're gonna find that there's no aquaporins here. So that remaining water is going to remain in our filtrate. However, in this segment, you're going to find that there are specific proteins that are going to allow this salt to exit this particular section. In the thin segment of our ascending loop, salt is gonna move from that higher concentration within the filtrate to the lower concentration in our interstitial fluid. So as we move upward into this thicker segment of our ascending loop of Henle, we're going to see a mass exodus of salt as it continues to move from the filtrate into our interstitial fluid. This is done through active transportation, further reducing that solute concentration within our filtrate and making this section more dilute. As the filtrate loses more salt, you can see that it becomes less concentrated by the time that it reaches the top of our ascending limb. Now we've moved on to our distal convoluted tubule. Substances like hydrogen, potassium, and ammonium are gonna be secreted into the filtrate with this particular section. Meanwhile, our salts, water, and more bicarbonate are gonna be reabsorbed from the filtrate back into that interstitial fluid. The distal tubule plays a crucial role again in pH regulation by readjusting the secretion and reabsorption of these substances. And then lastly, you reach our collecting duct, where the transformation of filtrate becomes urine. In this phase, salt continues to be reabsorbed. Water is also reabsorbed here as well, but is really tightly controlled by hormones, which are gonna regulate the volume of water that is needed to be reabsorbed based on what the body needs. So like we discussed, hormones are gonna regulate the water permeability within those collecting ducts, which is crucial for maintaining body hydration. For instance, if you have a dehydrated person, the collecting duct is gonna kick in and reabsorb as much water as possible back into the interstitial fluid. This is gonna result in a more concentrated urine because you have less water. 
Conversely, someone who has consumed a lot of water means that they are overhydrated. So the body's gonna be less reactive to reabsorbing water back into that interstitial fluid, leading to a less concentrated urine because there's a lot more water. We've also discussed previously how urea is reabsorbed and secreted at various points in the nephron. In the collecting duct, a significant amount of urea is going to remain in the filtrate. However, due to its high concentration, some urea is going to diffuse back into the interstitial fluid. And as we finish our journey, when it comes to urine production and expulsion through the body, we know that urine that's produced by the kidneys are going to move down here into our ureters where it's ultimately gonna be stored on our bladder and then it's eventually excreted through our urethra. I hope that this information was helpful in understanding the urinary system. As always, if you have any questions, make sure that you leave them down below. I love answering your questions. Head over to nursechunkstore.com where there's a ton of additional resources in order to help you ace those ATIT's exams. And as always, I'm gonna catch you in the next video. Bye!